the Song of Solomon. We're in the sixth chapter. We'll look back at the fifth and just give us a little bit of a chronology in this poem. Remember back in chapter 5, in verses 2 through 8, the Shulamite there had neglected her beloved, took him for granted, and he withdrew himself. Then in chapter 5, in verse 9, after in verse 8, she had charged the daughters of Jerusalem that if you find my beloved, tell him I'm sick of love. In verse 9, then we have the daughters of Jerusalem asking the question, what is Thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women. And what is thy beloved more than another beloved, thou that thou dost so charge us? And then in verses 10 through 16, the Shulamite rehearses why she believes her beloved is, as she says of him in verse 10, he is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000 and altogether lovely. And then we have in verse, chapter six and verse one, we have the daughters of Jerusalem asking then, where has your beloved gone? O thou fairest among women. Her answer in verses two and three that we looked at, to his garden to tend his flock. So he is about his duties in the gardens uh, there. And then we go to verses four through 10. The poem cuts away to the beloved who is rehearsing the beauty of the Shulamite. So it's as though she says he's there in the garden and then as if we are hearing him now uh, rehearsing these things concerning his beloved. Then we come to verse 11. In verse 11, 12, and 13. So there's, there's some varied ideas about who is speaking here. Uh, the translations like the New King James and the NIV and others who try to work it off the uh, gender of, in the Hebrew. Most of them agree that in verses 11 and 12 we have the Shulamite speaking. She is going to go where her lover is. We, we know that she said in verse 2 of chapter 6, my beloved has gone down into his garden. And then in verse 11, so she says, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded or blossomed. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. Return, and then we have the friends speaking, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return that we may look upon thee. What will you see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies, or in the Hebrew and in some of the other translations may say in the dance of the two armies. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would give us uh, an understanding in this section and some applications to our own lives as well. Our lives with our spouses as well as our life in Christ. We thank you for uh, this book that gives us uh, instruction on how to love one another and regard one another in the married state and also how The church is to regard Christ and how Christ has a regard to us. And we're thankful for that. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So the poem cut away previous to this, last time we were together to the beloved who was rehearsing the beauty of the Shulamite. But now, verse 11, the Shulamite, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the verdure or the fruit of the valley or the greenness as the Hebrew word is, the greenness of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed or blossomed. 
So the Shulamite is going down to the garden where he is. She had neglected him. She looked for him. She rehearsed his qualities, said he is in the garden. He rehearsed her qualities, and now she goes down into the garden where her beloved was, as it were, in the poem. The word garden here, I went down into the garden, is used elsewhere in the Old Testament just three times. It's used here, and then it's used three times in the book of Esther, and that's the only place it's used. Why some of the commentators say this is a Persian, or has a Persian derivation, that it's talking about uh, the days when Israel was there and Esther was there in Persia. It's in the court of the garden of the king, the palace garden, Esther 1.5. It says, and when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto the great and small seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So the Persians were known for their gardens and you have the famous hanging gardens. These were monstrous sized gardens, tiered gardens that they were famous for, so that their palaces were full of greenery and trees and fruit trees and fountains and waters diverted there to water all of this stuff. And so the king there in, in the palace is actually um, having this great get together there in the garden. Esther 7.7 7 says, and the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden and Haman stood up to make a request for his life to Esther the queen for he saw that there was evil determined against him. And then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine and Haman had fallen on the bed. So he had gone out into the gardens, angry, came back into the house. But these are the three usages of this word for garden, which is used in this poem here as well. Why some say this has to do, like Matthew Poole said, in the court of the garden, the Persian gardens were exceedingly large and pleasant. So in this poetic vision, she is transported to a garden, to this beautiful garden where her beloved is. And the word for garden, there's another word for garden that's used in the Hebrew that is used um, by Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes chapter two, when, it, when he talks about the fact that Solomon, he says, I made me great works, Ecclesiastes 2, 4. I made great works and I built houses and I planted me vineyards and I made me gardens and orchards. So it makes sense as far as the imagery that's being used. If we accept Solomon as the author of this, um, that he is speaking of these gardens. And knowing the riches of Solomon, he had probably tried to imitate or best the gardens that the Persians made there in Jerusalem. No doubt it was a beautiful place with the amount of money and labor force that he had to care for such things. So now she is going where her lover is and uh, he's tending the gardens and it says in Song of Solomon 6, 11, I went down to the garden of nuts to see the green of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had blossomed. So she says that she goes to see whether the, the fresh green plants or the verdure is there. Is it green? It's springtime to see if the vines are sending forth new buds in fruitfulness, to see if the pomegranates are blossoming. And this is the picture she paints for us. Poetically, it seems, since she's been talking about her beloved and she's looking for her beloved and now she's going down into the garden of her beloved, poetically, perhaps, the image seems to be her desire to see if that love relationship that she has with him is still green. Is it still bearing fruit? Is it still blossoming? Despite that little riff they had for a moment in which she neglected him and he departed and then she looked for him and then he went to the garden, spoke of her and now she's in the garden. And uh, to see, to see, is it still green? She had said earlier in the song, our bed is green. They're talking about the fruitfulness of their relationship. 
So she says in verse 12, chapter 6 and verse 12, before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots. In the old King James, it's a minadab from the Hebrew. Some translate it the, the willing people, the noble people. Um, the idea being that the Shulamite is transported to that garden. My soul, she says, my soul is become as the chariot of my princely people. Some believe it's speaking of kind of a transport. She's transported away to her beloved in this poem among the people of the prince in the garden there. And in verse 13, her friends then call to her and say, why? Because, why are they calling on her? Because she's so lovely to look at, it's to, to, to be with. It delights their heart when they're with her. Because they say, return, return, O Shulamite, return, that we may look upon thee. And then somebody asked the question, there's various ideas about who's asking the question here, but perhaps one of the friends is asking the question in verse 13 at the end, and what will you see in the Shulamite? They're saying, return, return, O Shulamite, so that we can look upon you. And one says, well, what will you see? What will you see if you see the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies. As it were, the company of two armies. The word for armies there is hosts, bands, companies, that idea of, of a group of people. What would you see in the Shulamite, as it were? And in the Hebrew, many of them translate it in the dance of the two camps or the two armies or the two groups, the dance of the two camps. So it seems to be talking about here in this company of two armies or the dance of the two armies, the idea in, in, in the poem of a celebratory dancing because this is how the word is used throughout the Old Testament. The idea of a celebration, the celebratory dances that the Hebrews had you remember when uh, children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 15, Miriam the prophetess comes out, Exodus 15, 20, sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancers. And that's our Hebrew word there, the idea of the dance and a celebratory dance for something that has happened. And then in Exodus chapter 32, this one was a celebration, but a bad celebration. This was when Moses was on the mount. He comes back down. They're celebrating, but it's an idolatrous celebration, but a dancing that's going on in it. And when Jephthah, Terah dealt with Jephthah in the ladies' conference, uh, it says the daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. Again, she was coming out to celebrate the victory. And then in Judges chapter 21 and 21, um, it says, and see and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances and then come out of the vineyards and catch a man his wife, that whole story of the Benjamites and how they uh, got them wives. But it was while they were doing celebratory dances. And then when David returned, you remember what made Saul mad because they were out dancing saying, David, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens, tens of thousands. So here in Song of Solomon, that same word is taken up when they say, the friends say, return, return, O Shulamite, because they delight in this princess. And they say, what will you see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company or the dance of the two armies, the dance of the two armies or the two camps is going on. And what he seems to be alluding to here within the story, this love story, is a kind of dance of the two lovers because you've got them having this issue and then she's lovesick for them and then she's pronouncing all these wonderful things upon her beloved and then he's returning that compliment as well and he's gone off to the vineyard and now, or the garden and now she's there. So what are you going to see? What are you going to see? The dance of the two camps. Courtship is a dance. It's a dance. Marriage is a dance. In 
an, an article called The Pirouette of Ideas, Dance as a Metaphor in the Poetry of, of W.B. Yeats by Julian White, talks about the dance and how it's used in, in poetry and certainly within this context, we're gonna be thinking about it within the context of courtship and marriage um, and how, how it's an, a fitting metaphor. She writes, in Yeats' poetry, dance is a metaphor for both tension and the resolution. However, Western culture does not consciously associate dance and tension. Most of the time when people are seen dancing, unless they're clumsy or odd, or both, their movements seem fluid and seamless, as if there seemed to be no tension between them at all. In the best dancing, the tension between the partners is imperceptible. Only partners who are unskilled, either independently or with an unskilled partner, reveal the tensions between them. The best dancers conceal the difficulty of their task with grace and talent and practice. So yes, that's true. If you're dancing with a partner, there's gonna be the tension and the tension is going to be whether or not you're going to move together in unity and in sync or not. And so there's gonna be that constant tension going on. But as he said, those who have learned to dance with each other, then you don't see that. She goes on to say, furthermore, the dance has healing, curative, restorative powers, which it does. It, it's a time of praise, it's a time of joy. It's a time of national joy and you know, people dancing in the streets when they win a victory and that sort of thing. Dance as exercise is often recommended, sometimes even prescribed by physicians to combat depression and other debilitating disorders. If the dance were the metaphor commonly underlying the way people in Western culture saw relationships, those relationships could possibly be marked with less confrontational hostility than they seem to be, given that many relationships are understood as warring factions instead of dancing partners. The dance between men and women will always be marked by tension. That tension is, in fact, necessary in order for the dancers to even move at all. However, it is also true that one partner, either one, he says it matters not which, but for our metaphor it will, must agree to follow while the other leads. Otherwise, they are paralyzed by the inertia created by unrelieved tension of both partners trying to lead. That's why you don't have 50-50 marriage, and that's why you have to have someone leading and someone following. The final resolution of tension collapses the space between the partners leaving the dancer alone and joyous, in other words, as one working together as one. So, yes, these are, these are aspects of the dance. What are you going to see with the Shulamite and her lover? You're going to see a dance. You're going to see a dance of two companies, a dance of two companies. Mary Maples Dodge had a little poem about dancing. This is just one stanza out of it. It says, Grandma says our modern jumping, hopping, rushing, whirling, bumping would have shocked the gentle folk long ago. No, they moved with stately grace, everything in proper place, gliding slowly forward, then slowly curtsying back again long ago. Their love is like the dance of two great hosts. It's two great hosts because marriage brings together two families and each of them have a wealth of history in their past and an army of people that has shaped their worldview, shaped their culture, shaped everything about them. When we talk about marrying somebody, you marry into that family. You marry into that culture. It's two great armies. And there has to be a dance there. And there's often tension, isn't there? Unless it is relieved. It's two hosts dancing because a good and godly marriage is a force for good. It's a force to be reckoned with. It's an influence for good in the world for Christ when the dance goes well and when they are following uh, the true leader, 
which is the Lord of heaven. It is a dance because there's give and take back and forth. There is compliments on each side and suggestions on each side. There is leading and following. The husband in scripture is charged with leading while the wife is charged with following. If the husband leads poorly, then the dance will not be pleasurable to behold. And if the wife follows poorly, the dance will not be pleasurable to behold. Of course, this marriage dance, the marriage dance, is not as easy to learn as a waltz, or as we did in Buffalo, because we were Polish, the polka, or whatever kind of dance you're trying to learn, or what the kids learn of these various uh, dances from other countries. Those dances seem, may seem hard at first, but they're relatively easy. Actually, they're extremely simple in comparison to the marriage dance or the courtship dance, especially the marriage dance once they are as an established couple. And the reason is, is because the marriage dance is not static. It doesn't remain the same. You can learn a dance, and then you've got that dance, and you can ply that dance, and you can do that dance, and you know that dance. But a marriage dance is not like that. It's not the same day by day. It changes with the challenges of life, and therefore it takes great skill to make this dance look fluid, the marriage dance. And yet there are couples that we have known who have learned to dance well by the grace of God and under many circumstances because God is their instructor and they have both learned to follow his lead. And so the dance, they make it look easy at times, even though it's never easy, easy. There is unity and mutual movement in order to accomplish a dance. And that's what there has to be in a, in a marriage, unity and mutual movement, a oneness. And there is intimacy, sharing a limited amount of space in a dance. And that's what a marriage is as well. Our marriage to Christ is a dance as well. He leads and we follow. He always leads well and he never makes a misstep. We're the one that makes that dance look bad if it looks bad <laughs> because he's always leading right. The mature Christian makes the dance look smoother. That's why some young Christians may look upon an older mature Christian whose faith is strong and who have a steadiness to their gait spiritual gate, and they may think, man, how, how do they make it look so easy? But the mature Christian makes it look smooth, acquiescing to the will and purpose of God, if they have learned to do that, and always seeing God's hand in all things and enjoying intimacy in the dance. David said, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing, into dancing. Even his mourning could be turned into dancing by the grace of God, as he followed the Lord, and as he trusted in the Lord, and as he looked to the Lord, and as he acquiesced in the Lord's providence for his life. There's a retired pastor, I ran across this on the net, by the name of James Tweedy, and he writes some poems. He wrote a poem on various types of dances. I'll just read what he said about the tango. He said to tango, as the saying go, as the saying goes, takes two, a truth which ought to be self-evident. For three, perhaps two women and one gent, would get all tango tangled in a skew. And tango solos would, of course, be bleak, for tango, as with every ballroom dance, is all about the passion of romance, and by yourself, you can't dance cheek to cheek. So grab a partner, tango if you dare, enfolding one another in embrace, and while acting out together face to face a torrid, heartfelt, dance floor love affair, when tangoing is never, when tangoing, it is never remiss to end the dance with an impassioned kiss. So yes, the dance of husband and wife, you can't dance by yourself, it doesn't work that way. You can't be face to face. You have to have each other, which takes patience and grace and kindness. And then Chris Lyon writes this about dance partners. A dance partner is the left to your right. 
They dance in the morning or late in the night. Some win, some lose, some blame, some cry, from the first competition to the final goodbye. Some dance partners can completely frustrate you. They push you and praise you until your next breakthrough. So let's take a moment to lend a kind word instead of the norm, severe or absurd, for dancing together is too great a gift to let fear and frustration develop a rift. Your partner's too special. As a pair, you connect. The best practice for practice is to practice respect. So I think we have here in the questioning of the end of chapter six, when she now is going down to be with her lover because she knows where, she, where to find him. And her friends want her to return because she is such a delight to behold and to be with. And the question from one asking the group, what will you see in the Shulamite? As it were, a dance of two armies, of two companies. That's what you're seeing. That's what you are seeing. That's what we've been seeing with the Shulamite and her beloved. It's a dance. And it's a dance that all married couples and all courtship couples have to have. A dance in which we learn how to lead and how to follow and how to uh, follow the Lord above everything else. The dance that the church has with the Lord only looks good because of the Lord and his grace and his kindness. We are continually out of step and we are continually f fighting the Lord's leading at times at times. Other times we can sweetly follow and the dance goes far better that way. But it is celebratory, a celebratory thing for us to be in Christ, to be dancing with the Lord as it were. Thank you, Father, for your word and we thank you for our blessed Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our, our husband, who is our uh, one who leads us and guides us and loves us and forever sets his love upon us and the force of his love is never abated. And we're thankful for that and uh, help us, O Lord, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him in all things, to learn to trust him in the lead, to learn what it is uh, to be intimate with him and to rejoice in that intimacy and to find in him all of our peace and all of our joy as we acquiesce in his purposes, his works, his ways, all of his doings, though they be strange at times to us. And we pray, Father, that you would grant us this for the sake of thy blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom, whose name we pray. Amen.